is going. It's okay, my great pleasure to uh, welcome Greg Restall, who is going to talk on proofs and models in philosophical logic, propositional logic, modal logic, and identity. And now the floor is all yours. Great. Uh, thanks, Sarah. Thank you so much for the invitation and uh, thank you for the warm welcome, uh, both to the British Logic Colloquium and to the British Isles. Um, it's I've you know long admired the British Logic Colloquium from afar, and it's lovely to be able to be at my first one, even though it's not quite the British Logic Colloquium that I expected. But hey, we'll we'll do face-to-face -face ones soon, soon enough. So as Sarah mentioned, that's what I'm going to be talking about. Here's the plan. I'm going to introduce uh, soundness and completeness, the relationship between proofs and models, just at a very, very high level, and then talk about three particular ways of looking at the significance of the relationship between proofs and models in logic, uh, in logic in general, and in philosophical logic in particular. I'm going to look at propositional logic and um, even though I am an Australian and Australians uh, working in philosophical logic are, you know, famous or infamous for looking at, you know, weirdo non-classical logics, I'm going to be looking at classical propositional logic and proof uh, in classical propositional logic and some of the issues around that. Then we'll move to looking at modal logic and in particular see whether there's ways of understanding in a new way the significance of possible world semantics for, for modal logics. And then we'll look at, um, just to make things uh, a bit tougher and a bit more interesting or differently interesting metaphysically, we'll look at identity and the uh, issue between you know, whether we should think of identity as necessary or contingent, um, and that, that'll be the talk. So this is at a fairly sort of high level. I'm not going to be getting into very many of the, the nitty gritty details, but I'll be very willing in Q&A for people to press me on, on anything. So if you think I'm going too fast, um, uh, yeah, pull me up uh, in the Q&A. If you think I'm going too slow, I'm not really sure what, what you can do. Uh, good luck. Soundness and completeness. Soundness theorem uh, that we teach our students uh, typically has the following structure. Uh, it says that if we can prove a conclusion from some premises, then the argument to the conclusion from those premises has got no counterexample. So uh, one way of writing it, you know, it's like this, where we think of this as the provability relation. Uh, the single barrel turnstile says that we can get, we can construct some proof uh, 2A from X and uh, the double barrel turnstile often uh, re represents sort of validity defined model theoretically in terms of the absence of counterexample. There's no model of X, which isn't also a model of A. Uh, that's usually, you know, proved by means of some kind of induction on the structure of the proof or some such thing. And this is typically, you know, an easier theorem to prove because proofs themselves have got a certain kind of structure. And on the basis of that structure, you show that any of the proofs that you construct, uh, you know, won't have any counterexamples to the things that they prove. Completeness is the converse of this result, which says that if you don't have a counterexample to some argument, then you've got a proof of the conclusion from the premises. And this is typically harder to prove uh, because if you don't have a counterexample, then it's not like you've got this thing called the absence of a counterexample, which I can then you know, construct my proof out of. I've got to do more work. Um, and typically we prove this by proving the contrapositive, which surprisingly enough uh, is uh, often works. But I want to just have a look at the, the structures of not the way that we prove soundness and completeness, but just what the, the validity statements define proof-wise or model-wise, what, what form those statements have got. If you look at uh, the provability statement, it's an existential statement which says there is something which is a proof. And the uh, uh, validity statement defined model theoretically, on the other hand, is a universal statement or a negated existential, which says that all models of the uh, premises are models of the conclusion too. And so they have a very different kind of logical structure. One's existential, one's a universal. 
And this is often seen where sometimes the natural thing to work with, uh, at least model theoretically, is the, neg is the negation, the invalidity statement, because that's the thing for which a particular model is going to be a certificate. Something is invalid uh, if we've got a model, which is a model of the premises, but isn't a model of the conclusion. And then I suppose you could negate the provability statement and you get something which is universal, which we don't often think of, uh, but the universal statement for non-provability says, you know, for any proof, if it is a proof from the premises, it, whatever it concludes in isn't that conclusion, it's got to be a proof of something else. Um, but if you look at these things, there's this sort of natural way of thinking about the certificate that a proof gives you is a positive verification of validity. And a certificate that a model gives you is a verification of invalidity. And the, dual, the, the opposites of those statements are the ones which are sort of universal. And so you can see how completeness is sort of difficult because we need to prove an existential statement about a particular existence of a proof from something which is a negated existential or a universal statement. And those things can be hard to prove uh, because we don't have, you know, any thing to, you know, base our construction on if we've just got, we don't have any counterexamples. And so there's interesting things to be said about the formal structure uh, and the sort of logical strength of soundness and completeness statements when it comes to, you know, abstract model proof theory. But I'm interested in, uh, in particular, the kind of philosophical uh, um, uh, upshot of these equivalences, because sometimes, um, and you can see this actually in the vocabulary for, that we choose for describing the soundness and completeness theorem, we think of soundness often as, you know, uh, a statement about a proof system, and it is sound if it agrees with the semantics, namely the models. And similarly, a proof system is complete if it gives you as enough answers uh, for all of the validity facts which are given to you by the models. You know, this, th this terminology was given by people that think that the models are giving you the meaning, the, the real, you know, extension of what counts as valid and what counts as invalid. And we're using the... Um, uh, the proof theory, uh, we're using soundness and completeness as a correctness criterion for our system of proofs. Yet, on the other hand, if we just think of this as a sort of a mathematical or a conceptual equivalence between two notions, if we've got two notions which are equivalent, and one of them has got sort of semantic significance, then presumably the other one could too. And well, that's what I'm interested in exploring. I'm interested in exploring the, the degree to which we can understand both proofs and models as telling us something very significant about an underlying validity relation. Or one way of thinking about this is, can we harness both proof and models to be doing sort of interesting conceptual and philosophical work? And that's sort of been the question in the back of my head that has been directing my research for the last 10 years or so. So that's the setup. Let's look all the way back at propositional logic, which hopefully you, you got a good handle on. Uh, models for classical propositional logic are really cool. They're really beautiful. They're really simple. I mean, of course, classical logic is crazy in, uh, as a theory of if and a theory of uh, everything you might want to say about negation and all of this other kind of stuff. But there is a kind of austere elegance in two-valued Boolean evaluations where just thinking about validity in terms of uh, having a Boolean valuation as a counterexample to an argument and just focusing on the single premise, single conclusion case, we say that an argument has a counterexample if we can cook up a Boolean valuation, which assigns one to the premise and zero to the conclusion. It's all kind of straightforward. And if you look at Boolean truth tables, I've only given you a very simple case here, the truth tables for and and or, You'll notice here that there's a beautiful, elegant kind of duality between and and or. If we swap the ones and the zeros uh, around, then and acts like or and or acts like and. Uh, this is why one reason we logicians kind of focus on um, uh, 
exclusive, I'm sorry, inclusive disjunction rather than exclusive disjunction, because we have this lovely duality uh, between, you know, a conjunction which is true only when both conjuncts are true, and a disjunction which is false only when both disjuncts are false. You've got this wonderful uh, sort of when it comes to the models of classical logic, you've got this wonderful bilateral symmetry between truth and falsity, which is sort of, you know, exhibited in a bunch of, you know, different theorems that you can prove. One of which is you've got this lovely notion of the dual of evaluation, which just assigns, you know, zero to everything that the other one assigns one to, et cetera, and the dual to a formula which swaps ands and ors and uh, swaps, you know, the material conditional with the, you know, dual of the material conditional, which is, you know, antecedent but not consequent and so on and keeps negation fixed. And you get this lovely result that if an argument is valid, then uh, the argument uh, found by dualizing the argument by going from the dual of the conclusion to the dual of the uh, uh, a premise, that that's also valid. If you've got a counterexample to the first one, you can just do your dualization thing and get the counterexample to, to the thing's dual. It's, it's lovely and sort of true false symmetric. This is, is, is sort of a fact of the underlying model theory of, of classical logic. Um, there's no uh, thing that one is doing that zero isn't doing uh, sort of reflected in some way. So this, this is a beautiful duality. If you look at this um, uh, sort of model theory, I mean, you look at this proof theoretically, though, you know, if I was sort of focusing on Hilbert proofs, for example, uh, I've just got one, you know, very simple Hilbert proof here of the identity axiom following from, you know, distribution and weakening using modus ponens. You know, there's no underlying true false duality that's there in Hilbert proofs, where a Hilbert proof system says dub a few of these things as axioms and have a few inference rules as modus ponens. And then, uh, you know, something is provable if you can construct a proof from the premises to the conclusion where you're allowed to also add the axioms and you follow the rules. That is really non-self-dual in the way that the uh, sort of Boolean evaluations uh, are. Um, there's some kind of um, truth priority that is going there. The Hilbert system has got axioms. It doesn't have co-axioms, uh, which are the things which are you know, self-evidently false, for example. You've got inference rules, which go from a bunch of premises to a conclusion. Uh, you don't have dual inference rules, anything like that. Um, uh, let's get a nicer kind of uh, proof system, though, uh, like natural deduction. Natural deduction, you've only got one axiom, uh, which is uh, make the assumption. And that's nicely self-dual, if you think about it. You know, if A is true, it's true. On the other hand, you could be looking at from reverse and saying that, well, if A is not true, it's not true. You know, it works up, down, bottom up, lovely. Uh, but look at these two proofs here. One of them... The first one uh, on the left, oh, let me see if I, the first one on the left here uh, is a proof from the premise P to the conclusion P or Q and P. And if I dualize that, uh, the dual of the conclusion here is P or P and Q. And indeed the argument from P or P and Q to P is also valid in Boolean you know, logic just follows from the rules for and and or. And indeed, if you look at Genson style, private style, natural deduction, you've got a proof of it from P or P and Q uh, to P, uh, but it looks very different from the proof from P to P or P and Q. You don't get one by turning the other one upside down. The rules are very different, uh, even though uh, they are sort of have got this kind of duality in the underlying sort of Boolean semantics. So, uh, yeah. Are there proof systems that, un that, that display this kind of true-false duality? Uh, why am I harping on the true-false duality, by the way? Well, one, if you're a mathematician, 
it's just elegant and it's kind of there in the system if you understand it proof there um, model theoretically so it's kind of an interesting question about whether you can have that proof theoretically but also philosophically speaking there are some people that think that when it comes to meaning uh you know we should be treating truth and falsity um uh, you know, with equal weights. There's this kind of tradition in semantics of what's called bilateralism. And uh, Hilbert systems and uh, standard brand natural deduction doesn't sort of satisfy this kind of true-false um, symmetry. Uh, on the other hand, uh, Ganson's sequent calculus does. His uh, two sequent calculus derivations of exactly uh, the sort, kind of sequence that I want in this case, I'm being anally retentive about repetitions of formulas uh, because we're you know, merging these two uh, sequence here. Actually, just read this one from top to bottom. This is the you know, thing which says from P follows P. So introducing an OR on the right, we get from P to P or Q. We also get from P to P, and I'll write that down again, and then we'll merge these two together. We've proved P or Q and we've proved P. So we can prove their conjunction from both of the premises. So, you know, if you don't care about repetitions, then I could have written down just one of those. But if you care about the difference between sort of multiplicative and additive rules, which some of you know about, uh, then I'm just using the multiplicative one here. Um, and, and this, you know, has got in one sense exactly the same kind of structure that this one does. You'll see we just appeal to the P twice, once to justify this conjunction and once to justify, I mean, that conjunct and once to justify uh, the, the other conjunct. And so they, they're both there in those leaves of the proof. Well, you know, this got exactly that same kind of structure, but represented sequent wise. But in Genson's sequent calculus, uh, for classical logic, where you allow a bunch more formulas to appear on the right-hand side, the derivation for the dual of the thing is exactly self-dual. It's got exactly the same kind of mirror structure where it is, you know, a kind of a rotational mirror reflection of the thing where the and rules on the left look exactly like the or rules on the right. The or rules on the left look exactly like the and rules on the right, uh, except they're operating on the different sides of the sequence. In general, the sequence that you get here have got this form where you can have a bunch of formulas, A and B, and this is read as saying, well, uh, let's have C and D as the conclusions. One way of reading this is saying that from the assumption of the A's and B's, A and B being true, at least one of the C's and D's has got to be true too. So if the premises are read conjunctively, then the conclusions follow disjunctively. Here, it's just P or P, so that's just P. Or if you could think of it as you're making a mistake if you assert the left-hand side and you deny the right-hand side, something like this. Assert all of the A and B being true and deny each of C and D uh, being true. Uh, and so you've got this reading, it's nicely self-dual, and it's, it's kind of lovely. Um, it's, it's sort of a, a notion of proof. It's a notion of um, uh, uh, you've got a structure for every valid argument. You've got this finite way of getting to the conclusion from the premises and everything. It's got a soundness and completeness theorem, and, and it, it's also got this nice kind of true-false duality. But what Genson did with this is he generalized the proof context by saying that, well, the right thing for us to be modeling is not just getting from these premises to that conclusion. We want to do that. But one way to do that nicely and with wonderful formal properties is to do this in a more general context where we look also at going from a bunch of premises to a bunch of conclusions. And so that's what he did. And so uh, when you do that, uh, you've got this uh, interesting inference rule called cut, uh, which is when it comes to the old world where we only had one conclusion. So let's uh, just think of this 
why here is being C at the moment. And just think of the old world of proofs from a bunch of premises to a single conclusion. You can see how, uh, well, this is called cut because we're cutting out the middle uh, term. Uh, here we go from X to A, and there we go from X and A to C. Um, actually, let me uh, not use the additive one. Let me do this with the multiplicative one up here. Get rid of one conclusion, uh, that, that extra conclusion Y here, and convert this uh, Y prime to one particular form conclusion formula C. So this is the original world where we were just thinking of premises and a conclusion. So we're cutting out this middle term A and going straight from X and X prime to the conclusion C. Well, what that means in uh, when it comes to proofs, if I think of this as proving a proof which gets me from X to A, on the other hand, I've got another proof which gets me from X prime and A to C, then you can see, okay, well, if I just jam the two proofs together, compose them, what I get is a proof from X and X prime to C. It's a very natural thing. It's a very natural kind of inference rule. And it's one which is sort of not about any particular connective, but just about the kind of topology of how we combine bits of reasoning together. Uh, and it's, it's really sort of fundamentally important in, in the theory of proofs. Often it's so important that it went by unnoticed until people sort of made it explicit and said, oh, it's, a, it's an interesting rule, which we should pay attention to. I've got here two forms of the rule, which look almost the same, um, one with an sort of annotated with an M and one with an A, M for multiplicative and A for additive, for those of you that care about that distinction. And that's um, one way of understanding it is like saying, oh, I'm building, I've got my proof from X to Y with A as one conclusion, or I've got another proof from X prime and A to other conclusions, and I can jam those two proofs together and I collect all of the premises and all of the conclusions together. The other one is really natural when it's read from bottom to top. Kind of says that if I don't, if I've got a counterexample to the argument from X to Y, then one way of thinking about that is, okay, well, let's look at that counterexample. Either that's a counterexample uh, in which A is true, in which case it's a counterexample to the argument from X and A to Y, or it's a counterexample to an argument, uh, it's a counterexample in which A isn't true, in which case it's a counterexample to the argument from X to Y with A as an alternate conclusion, because in that evaluation, A isn't true and neither is any of the Ys. And so it's sort of naturally read from the bottom up where you're, you're already thinking, okay, all of the Xs are true and the Ys aren't. It's going to be important in what follows. What's um, really what I want us to pay our attention to, though, is that in this kind of context, the completeness proof is mathematically sort of a powerful thing to prove. It's still something where you've got to sort of construct a model stage by stage by considering formulas and things. But there's a kind of elegance to the way the thing is proved in this setting which isn't really present if you're doing completeness for a Hilbert system or something like that. The form of the completeness proof goes like this. If there's no derivation of a sequent, there's no way to derive a sequent, then there's some valuation which assigns one to each member of the left and a zero to each thing that was on the right. That's what we're wanting in terms of a Boolean counterexample. And if you look at that additive cut rule and you look at it like this, it says, if I can't derive uh, from X to Y, if I can't construct a derivation from X to Y, then either indeed I can't derive this one or I can't derive that one. One of them has got to be underivable because if I could derive both of them, then I could get from X to Y just by appealing to cut. So either this one, uh, you know, if I, if I already know that there's no proof which gets me from X to Y, then I know either that this one's not provable or this one isn't. Okay, so what happens is if you think of uh, position as being available, kind of saying, okay, 
I can't get from X to Y. So, you know, saying all of the X's are true and saying all of the Y's aren't, that's kind of an available position. That's There's nothing self-undermining there. Then, okay, one of chuck an A in the left or chuck an A in the right is also available. Okay, so with logicians, we can idealize, consider all of the language and just consider every formula one by one and just chuck them in the left, chuck them in the right. It's the cut rule here, which kind of says, as I take that walk down the language, a path here is always gonna be available. Just look at the limit of that path. That's gonna give you a Boolean evaluation because you've just chucked everything either in the left or the right. And because derivations are finite, uh, if, there's, if, if you never, you know, were forced to choose a non-available position, that means you're never going to get a derivation from anything on the left to anything on the right. And that means this gives you a Boolean evaluation, something which assigns one to everything on the left and one to a zero to everything on the right, which is going to be a counterexample to your original argument. It's, it's, it's lovely. It's cut, which is doing all of the work. Uh, so that's, yeah, take the process all the way up to 11 and you've got your valuation. Well, you might be wondering where the hell did the connective rules come in this? Valuation has got to respect and or not, you know, all of that kind of stuff. Well, look at the rules for the connectives. One way to understand the rules for the connectives is that the, the proof rules can have this form. And these are certainly enough to define the connectives. And this is really sweet. Uh, the, you know, look at the rule for a conjunction which kind of says you can get from the top to the bottom or the bottom to the top, doesn't really matter. Uh, what is it for a conjunction to be true? It's for both conjuncts to be true. But this is understood proof theoretically. If I want to derive something from a conjunction, well, what can I do? I can derive all the conjuncts. On the other hand, if I want to show that I can derive a conjunction, well, the way to do that is to derive, both, uh, derive it from both conjuncts. Uh, it's, and, and you can look at the other rules. They've got all of this kind of form. They, they, they're nice proof rules, which give you the standard left-right rules for the sequence calculus. But they've got this wonderful form. If you look at this in the limit, in that limit of the making the valuations, these totally agree with the Boolean truth conditions. If being on the left in the limit is, I'm taking you to be true, and being on the right in the limit is, I'm taking you to be false, then these rules look exactly like the Boolean valuations. A disjunction is false just when both of the disjuncts are false. A conjunction is true just when both conjuncts is true. A conditional is false just when the antecedent is true and the consequent is false. And a negation is false just when the thing negated is true. And that, together with the fact that the Boolean valuation is total on the language, is enough to give you what you're getting there in the limit as being a Boolean valuation. So the completeness proof is, is, is nice and modular and elegant and it's, it's gorgeous. Uh, but what about the philosophical work? Well, this is something that I've been arguing for a while, which is that one way to understand this is, is to take that you know, metaphor I was saying about a position being available, take that kind of seriously and say, so, well, let's not think of the meaning as given first by the Boolean valuation and the truth conditions, because truth is hard. And mm, don't want to you know, assume that we understand the concept of truth and truth conditions and all of that kind of thing first. Instead, let's just think of you know, the, the practice of asserting and denying and everything and say that, well, you know, if I assert something and you deny it, then there's no shared position that we're both taking about this. We're disagreeing with each other. And if um, uh, so asserting something and denying it is kind of out of bounds, then we can understand a derivation is maybe showing us how asserting each member of the left of the sequence and denying each member of the right is also out of bounds because you can see <clears throat> The kind of structural rules, uh, this is one way of understanding where derivations start. It's sort of a combination of the identity rule and weakening. This kind of says that if I assert A and I deny A, no matter what else I assert and deny, I've contradicted myself, okay? And the cut rule, understood additively, one way of thinking about that. Now, not thinking in terms of truth conditions, 
you know, if it's sort of okay to assert all of the X's and deny all of the Y's, if it's inbounds to, you know, assert the X's and deny the Y's, and it is sort of out of bounds to assert A, where it's sort of contradictory, you know, it's a, there's no available position. So I'm not saying that it's, you know, warranted or anything, like it's not warranted to assert A, but it's actually, you know, um, uh, you know, actually, let me start with the other, the other side. Let's say that, that this one, that A is undeniable. That means to deny it is totally out of bounds. It's not saying that it's unwarranted to deny, but it's undeniable in this strong sense. Then, well, if something is undeniable, uh, then there's a very natural move to say that, well, to assert it is just to make explicit what was implicit already. You know, what are you doing when you prove something to somebody? You're just showing them, you know, this thing is undeniable. So if we want to take a stand on it, the only stand that's left to take is to assert it. So in the paper that I wrote in 2005, uh, multiple conclusions, I kind of argued that this is a way of semantically understanding the sequent calculus uh, for classical logic in such a way as to not assume that truth and falsity are doing all of the work, but which still has that kind of self-duality stuff going on. And the neat thing about that when you do this is that these inference rules really sort of look like kind of definitions. If you think of a practice which involves asserting and denying, and we think of what might be involved in adding to our vocabulary the logicians and or the logicians or or the logicians material conditional, then you could think of this as saying that, well, you know, let's say denying a material conditional has just got the same force as asserting the antecedent and denying the consequent. Or denying a disjunction has got the same force as denying both disjuncts. Or denying a negation has got the same force as asserting the negation. There's a way of understanding these in terms of adding to our vocabulary stuff in terms of things that we already had. But these aren't kind of rewrites or um, uh, just abbreviative definitions. They're not, they're not bad, but they are ways of showing how to add to our vocabulary stuff uh, which is defined in terms of combinations of the things that we can already do. And in other work, I've you know, argued that this sat sort of satisfies nice, sane criteria of conservative extension and uh, unique definability. Uh, and this goes into the you know, argument about Tonk and all of that kind of thing. Anyway, I'm not going to go in that. However, uh, another British logician, uh, Florian Steinberger, uh, you know, argued that now yeah, this is kind of cool and everything, but it's not proof. Uh, it's the sequent calculus, and that's interesting, and it tells you something about assertion and denial, but it's not proof. If you're doing proofs with proof theory, then proofs are proofs of things. They're not proofs of disjunctions of things or things understood disjunctively or anything like that. A conclusion should remain single. And I think this is, there's something in Florian's, uh, uh, I don't think that's an argument against what I was doing. It's just saying that it's not proof theory narrowly construed. Okay, that's cool. He can have that. There's something to this point too. Uh, if you think of what proofs are doing as, uh, well, what am I doing when I'm proving A? One way of understanding this is that I'm meeting a justification request for the assertion of A. So thinking of, say, you know, Sarah says A, and I say, what? Uh, then she might offer a justification of that. And it might just be a thing to get me to shut up or whatever, but a really hardcore justification of something is a proof, which is kind of apodictic in the sense that if I grant the premises on which the proof is made, then this answers the question conclusively. Okay, there's a, there's a job that proof is doing. Uh, which is meeting justification requests up to a really high standard, at least conditionally upon the other premises which are used. Now, not every way to meet a justification request is a proof, but proofs do meet justification requests. And so then you could ask the question, okay, well, what's the context in which justification requests are met? If the context in which justification requests are met is just your other assumptions, where your other assumptions are other 
things which are granted, which are understood positively as assertions or assertion-like things like suppositions or assumptions, then the natural shape of this is indeed a bunch of premises and a single conclusion. And the kind of thing that your proof is going to look like is not going to have this kind of duality where you've got all of the left and right stuff going on. On the other hand, if you think that the kind of context is both things that you've ruled in and things that you've ruled out, then the natural shape that you're going to look at look like is, okay, the X's are the things that you've ruled in and the Y's that you've ruled out and the A is the thing that you're justifying. Then the structure that you're going to look like has got a bunch of things on the left and it's got a bunch of things on the right, but the things on the right, you know, some of them are kind of sort of thought of as alternate conclusions, things that would be active if we hadn't already ruled them out or uh, temporarily ruled them out sort of as suppositionally. Uh, but one of them is sort of give it a halo uh, as the thing which we are proving as true. And so you can get this different interpretation of the sequence calculus where you focus on one thing on the right hand side and say that's the thing that we're proving in the context of granting all the other things on the left and positively and granting all of the, the other things on the right negatively, you know, setting them aside temporarily. And so you get a kind of proof system which isn't sort of self dual, but you do get something which is uh, kind of elegant and interesting uh, and almost self dual. Uh, but you then get the question, okay, if we're bilateralist, you ask yourself the question, well, what's the kind of thing that you're justifying in that context of ruling things in and ruling things out? And if the answer is it's always an assertion, then you get this kind of interesting calculus where there's stuff going on on the conclusion side, which isn't on the premise side. On the other hand, if the things that you can justify are assertions and denials, then you've got two sort of structures that you keep on in parallel. One where you're blessing something on the right-hand side is a conclusion that we are proving in a context. On the other hand, you could also think of something as a conclusion that we're refuting in a context is the thing that we are denying. And then you get this total duality. And this is one way of understanding what's now called sort of bilateralist proof theory or natural deduction. Sometimes this is understood in terms of sort of tree proofs where things are signed positively or negatively. And here you get this really interesting kind of literature of what's the kind of right way of doing classical proof theory, which is sort of natural, connects up with our practice and uh, is sort of formally elegant as well. Okay, that's, that's the classical stuff. Now, uh, we'll breathe in and breathe out and I'll talk about modal logic. The other sections are gonna be quick. Let's have a look at necessity and possibility. You know, modal logic's filled with claims like necessary the P, it's possible the P, all of that kind of jazz. Box P, diamond P, which you're familiar with. Possible worlds models have got this kind of structure. We might say that P is possible. When is that true? Well, among the possible worlds, we can find a world where P is true, okay? On the other hand, we might say that Q is necessary. What does that mean? Well, all of the possible worlds are worlds where, where Q is true. And then you might, once we've got these worlds, they've got to decide every proposition one way or another. So we get these, not just Boolean valuations, but Boolean valuations over a whole bunch of points or worlds. And this uh, raises the question, how seriously should we take these models? You know, uh, if I take them really seriously, I've got to have an answer to the question, what sort of thing is a world? Um, and if I take them, if they're doing explanatory work, I've got to answer the question, well, given a world, what is true at that world? Um, and also, given any such world, how can we know what turns out to be true there? And that's actually a really, really tricky question, depending on a uh, tricky question to answer, depending on your answers to some of the earlier questions. Um, now, famous person in British logic colloquium history, Arthur Pryor, um, uh, said this. I'm not going to go through the whole uh, quote here, which is there for you to read. But he says, mm, you know, what he calls states of affairs or possible worlds, those sorts of things, yeah, they make sense. We understand them, but we understand truth in uh, a possible world or truth in a state of affairs because we already understand it's necessary that and not vice versa. The explanatory work 
is goes from necessity to possible worlds, from possibility to possible worlds. We do not understand uh, box and diamond, or it's necessary that, or it's possible that, because we understand possible world semantics in the first place. Semantics of that kind is not how we acquire the concept. That's not how we gain our understanding, according to Pryor. And I reckon he's right. Uh, however, that raises the question, okay, well, how the hell do we understand necessity and possibility? And furthermore, why is it that the logic of necessity and possibility seems to have possible worlds more than its models? Uh, that's a big question. And I think uh, the way this works is that modal reasoning trades on supposition and context shift. And this is something that we know how to do, but this is not at the level of truth and model and truth in a model or truth in a, at a point in a model, but this is at the level of sort of dialogue and discourse and uh, reasoning and proving and that sort of thing at the level of our cognitive and communicative actions. So we could say Oswald shot Kennedy, but suppose he hadn't. Well, suppose Oswald hadn't shot Kennedy. Hmm, what had happened then? And, and these sorts of acts of supposition, you know, we consider what things would have been like then. And that does not mean at this stage that there's this thing called what things would have been like then that we are trying to imagine. Where, I'm, where you and I are trying to get in touch with this object, but rather what we're doing is we're doing our reasoning and we're doing our reasoning where we're allowed to import some of the things that we take to be and we're bracketing other things that we take to be. And that's what happens when we suppose and we suppose somebody hadn't. Uh, on the other hand, uh, another kind of context shift that can happen in our discussion and reasoning is I could say, I think that Oswald shot Kennedy, but let's suppose you're right. You're a, you know, a truther about these things. Uh, and you think that there was somebody else that shot Kennedy. I might say, well, let's suppose you're right and Oswald didn't shoot Kennedy. Okay, and then I might again bracket some things uh, that I hold to be the case, but now in my reasoning do other things and open up another context where I'm going to be asserting and denying and supposing and doing all of the other things that I do, where I import some things from my current context, but leave other things aside. And you'll notice both of these things are contexts in which Oswald didn't shoot Kennedy, but they're different ones. You know, in, in the context where Oswald uh, hadn't shot Kennedy, uh, presumably the question of whether Kennedy was shot in that context is still open. Yeah, maybe somebody else would have gone around to shoot Kennedy if Oswald didn't. But uh, if, if Oswald hadn't shot Kennedy. On the other hand, if we're considering, you know, you're right, somebody else shot Kennedy and not Oswald. Well, in that context that we're thinking about, we presumably still suppose that Oswald was shot. Sorry, that Kennedy was shot. Who knows? Who knows what happened to Oswald? But in these cases, what we're doing is we're, you know, asserting, we're denying, we're supposing, we're doing all of these kinds of things. And we're keeping two contexts available, one in which we're granting Oswald shot Kennedy and another where we're, you know, operating on, uh, you know, taking for granted that Oswald didn't shoot Kennedy and doing other things with that. Now, one of these is sort of a subjunctive context, how things could have been had things gone differently. And that thing, I think, is connected with our acts of planning, uh, because this is the kind of thing that we do when we do this is kind of retrospective activation of the same kind of thing that we do in the case of future uncertainty about what's happening. You know, we could imagine what we're doing, I think, is, you know, running things back to the past uh, before Oswald shot Kennedy and imagining that things go differently from there. And that's the same kind of thing that we do in cases where we think that a bunch of different options are open and things might go differently. And that's kind of subjunctive reasoning, which is connected with planning. That's different to indicative or epistemic re re uh, reasoning, which is uh, connected with dispute resolution and trying to resolve disagreements and everything, where I think something's the case, you think something isn't the case, and you think that's what's actually the case, and I don't think that's what's actually the case, but I might say, suppose you're right, and this is what's actually the case. Because these are different views about what's actually going on, not views about what could have happened had things gone otherwise in other non-actual circumstances. 
this is all well, well known. Possible world semantics is useful in modeling both of these notions, right? So I want to consider both of these options. But at the level of what we do when we reason and when we talk and when we think and when we discuss, rather than thinking about the world semantics in the first place. The idea is that granting that A is necessary clashes with denying A in one of these other context shifts. So if we open up a context shift and I say, suppose blah, and now we consider what's going on under the scope of that supposition, if in that supposition, in that context, I deny A, and back in my home, as it were, I assert that A is necessary, that's a clash. Because for something to be necessary is for it to not only hold, but it also hold no matter what. Well, but hang on, we were talking about two different kinds of context shifts. So we'll have one kind of kind of subjunctive necessity. This would have happened, this would still be the case no matter how things would have gone. And then this kind of epistemic necessity of no matter which of us is right, this is still going to be the case. One of them is going to be kind of subjunctive metaphysical necessity, and the other is going to be something like, you know, is a priori knowable or provable or something. But regardless, necessity makes sense in both of these kinds of ways. And there's a way of understanding this as being sort of defined, and I'm not going to go through the uh, sort of nitty gritty details of this, but this has got exactly the same kind of logical structure, except we're allowing our positions to not just involve flat assertion and denial, but assertion and denial across different contexts or zones, whether we understand those epistemically or uh, sort of subjunctively. Uh, so you could think of this as saying that to deny that A is necessary is got the same cash value as denying A, not as actually denying A, but opening it up another zone and denying A there. Or if you like, if I want to prove that A is necessary, I need to not only prove A from my other assumptions, but I need to prove that A would are held no matter what. And that's in an arbitrary zone. You know, I say, well, suppose things have gone differently. Why would A be the case? And if you can show that, then you've proved A. On the, proved, not only proved A, but proved that A is necessary. That's the shape of this. So denying A has got the force of, denying that A is necessary has got the force of denying A in a fresh context. And you can go through, uh, you know, a kind of uh, sort of hypersequent calculus for necessity for different kinds of necessity corresponding to different kinds of context shifts. Okay. And you can show that this has nice logical behavior, just follow these rules, combine them with the rules of negation and everything else like this. And you actually get the logic S5. It's very simple and straightforward and kind of cute. And cut understood sort of multiplicatively or additively has got the same kind of structure, which means you can have the same kind of completeness theorem that you had in other cases where you just say, if something is non-derivable using these kinds of rules, then we can construct a, we can fill out a position to make a, a model, except now a model is not just a Boolean evaluation of these things being true and these things are being false, but rather they're these things being true here and false there, or these things being true here and these things being false there, and a bunch of different zones. And what happens is that you get a model for S5 out of this. Uh, zones in limit positions are kind of like worlds. But they're kind of these places where you assert things and deny things, except they're taken to the limit to actually decide everything one way or another. Actual zones in a conversation are never that omniscient or anything like this. But the models that's generated out of this satisfy that kind of constraint. So every world decides every statement one way or another. The Boolean connectives have got their usual properties. And you know, box A is false in one of these, just when A is false in one world or other. And box A is true in one of these, just when A is true in all of them. You get the S5 universal model thing very, very easily. But then we can help prior answer his open question. We understand modal concepts by governing our assertions and denials and our inferences by way of these rules. 
And if we connect the use of modal vocabulary with our asserting, denying, supposing in a way which is structured in this way, you can see how it turns out that the things which are true in all of the modal models are the things which turn out to be undeniable if we follow these rules. The things which can be falsified are the things which turn out to have safe positions where that position is open given uh, that you govern your modal vocabulary and your other vocabulary by way of these rules. And so since this happens, we've got an explanation of why possible worlds models get the behavior right, even though models are just models. You don't need to bump into a possible, worlds, a possible world to understand how Box and Diamond works. And this is explanatorily rich. It works for epistemic and metaphysical models in the same kind of way. And it can sort of generalize. Um, uh, um, Francesca Poggiolesi's, you know, book on tree hypersequence kind of says how you can get, you know, other kind of model models out of this. And the result is you get two different kind of perspectives on modal vocabulary: the representational one and the sort of normative pragmatic one. The representational one, which kind of says, okay, here's how we're representing the world. If we want to think about representing an entire world by using our language. And that's the, the model way of looking at things. On the other hand, here's the way that we do things, which turns out to have this kind of structure when we idealize things to the limit. And that's the, the proof way of looking at things. Okay, in the last couple of minutes, I'm going to sketch what this says about, you know, objects. Okay, oh, look at this, here's Steve. Um, hi, Steve. Uh, Steve told us how identity works. Um, it's great. Um, Putting Steve's rules for identity from that lovely little analysis paper in this kind of context, they, they've got this form, uh, where the F is a predicate which is free in the, in other, it's a predicate which uh, does not appear on the, the lower, lower half of the, C, uh, the, the rule here. It's called an eigen predicate, if you like, in the same way that you get eigen variables in uh, uh, the proof theory for first order quantifiers. Uh, the, the way of understanding this is to deny A that A is identical to B has got the same significance as taking there to be some feature that holds the A but not B, or vice versa. Uh, or if you'd like to prove that A is identical to B, you want to show that every feature A's got, B's got. Okay. Uh, identity on this view turns out to be a kind of indistinguishability. And so you, if you bolt that onto what I had before with um, the modal rules, it turns out that uh, identity looks like it becomes necessary automatically, uh, that if A is identical to B, that it is necessarily. And this is kind of, you know, sweet if you're Tim Williamson and you think, uh, hey, that's just the way that modal modality and identity and everything should interact. You know, he says, bunch of things here which I'll let you uh, read in your own time. Uh, you can download the slides from my website. He kind of says, you know, the model theory just inexorably leads you to think that identity has got to be necessary. Uh, other models are just, uh, you know, retrograde. You're uglifying your logic uh, if you have contingent identity, etc. Uh, and that's just bad. Um, I think that's wrong. Um, I think that model logics with contingent identity are also elegant and useful and completely natural, especially when you're thinking of the, uh, the interpretation of the modality as epistemic. Okay. If you're thinking of epistemic modality, identity's got to be contingent. Um, you know, I know, and you know that Hesperus is phosphorus. On the other hand, it was a discovery that Hesperus is phosphorus. Uh, you know, somebody that denies that Hesperus is phosphorus is not being inconsistent, and that was epistemically open to people. Okay. Uh, it's consistent to grant, uh, I think, that A is identical to B, and to distinguish A from B in another context, especially when that context shift is an um, epistemic context shift. I think that's obvious. We learned that Hesperus is phosphorus, but the possibility that Hesperus wasn't phosphorus was epistemically open to us. It was one of those things that we learned. Uh, I think that's, uh, on the other hand, when it comes to subjunctive shifts, 
I think that this is much less plausible. If I grant that Hesperus is phosphorus, then if I'm planning a trip to Hesperus, then of necessity on that trip, I'm going to phosphorus. Okay, that's in the circumstance that I'm planning. I should keep that in mind. If I know that Hesperus is Venus and I know that the temperatures are on Venus, uh, you know, whatever it is that they actually are, then I've got to pack really good sunscreen, etc., and really good breathing equipment uh, for when I end up at Hesperus. There's no chance uh, if Hesperus is Venus that when I get there, um, I'm not going to have to struggle with the, the heat. Now, uh, and Williamson concedes this. He says, I'm not interested in epistemic readings if it's possible that. Well, uh, he's not, and I am. Um, so I just want to sketch in the remaining minute or two uh, the way that you can go here uh, without uglifying your logic in a very natural kind of way. Uh, one way you can go uh, is just bolt on Steve's identity rules to the uh, modal context where we've now got hypersequence rather than sequence. And you want to say that to prove that A is identical to B, you don't want to show that in this context, every feature A has, B has, but you want to show that in any context, uh, any feature A has, B has, or vice versa. And this, so this identifies identity with indistinguishability, where the ability is across the different contexts. And this goes nicely with the kind of subjunctive planning story. And there you do get necessary identity if you think of identity as being governed in that kind of way. Here's a proof uh, that if A is identical to B, then it's necessarily so, just using those rules. It's very elegant. On the other hand, for epistemic shifts, you might want to block this kind of rule. You want to say, okay, uh, it's totally fine to assert that A is identical to B, to in another context, grant that FA and deny that FB, where that uh, context is different, a different epistemic context. But you still want to say that if A is identical to B and A's got a feature, B's got that feature. So how do you do that in a way which is kind of logically coherent? Well, first thing, this requires distinguishing kinds of predicates, because we also want to distinguish, uh, uh, we want to reject the inference from A is identical to B. A has the feature of being known to be identical to A. Those things are true. But B doesn't have the feature of being known to be identical to A. You just want to say that, uh, you know, the epistemic modality does not create a feature predicate. And what you can derive is from A is identical to B. And if I has some feature, B has got that feature. But epistemic modalities, quantifying into epistemic modalities, whatever that is, gives you a predicate, sure, but it doesn't give you a feature predicate. So you want to, to distinguish A from B, you want to find some feature that A has and B lacks, and not vice versa. And epistemic modalities don't generate features. After all, there's no argument against Hesperus being phosphorus, that it's epistemically necessary that Hesperus is phosphorus, but it's not epistemically necessary that Hesperus is phosphorus. That's all well known. So all you need to do is to say, okay, our language has got feature predicates, it's got general predicates too. Be careful if you've got lambda abstraction and everything about what uh, abstracts generate. Feature predicates are closed under the classical connectives and quantifiers and, and, and you know, lambda abstraction. That's all fair enough. Applying uh, lambda abstraction into uh, epistemic modal context creates a general predicate and not a feature predicate. And I've not talked about this, but there's ways of specifying feature predicates and general predicates. We don't need to do that. Uh, then if I've got this sequence separator as being an epistemic shift, then we don't require identity claims to jump across those. I only require them to stay in my zone uh, for features. And if I had both kinds of epistemic and non-epistemic shift. You can have two-dimensional semantics in this way lies, 2D stuff and combining both modalities. And then you allow it to, you allow the epistemic modal to, the epistemic modal goes across a double bar and the um, uh, sort of metaphysical modal only stays within the epistemic line. We can talk about that in, in discussion. Anyway. The modal rules turn out to be conservative and uniquely defining relative to the choice of context shift, which is kind of sweet. 
And that means, um, uh, and the necessary identity rules are conservative and uniquely defining given the choice of predicates that you have in your language. And so the whole point here is, you know, necess identity is about distinguishability and indistinguishability and whether or not the thing that I'm getting here is a logical notion, something which is given by definition, is relative to the choices of vocabulary in which that thing is defined. And so if you've got some vocabulary where it is given in terms of these predicates, and I've got some vocabulary where it's given in terms of these predicates, the question about whether your identity predicate and my identity predicate are um, the same thing when we merge those two languages depends on what we do to the predicates when we join these two languages. Do I recognize your predicates as being predicates and mine? And often we just assume that that's what happens when I merge two languages. But uh, when it comes to uh, epistemic necessity, that's where this becomes a real choice because we need to make the choice of, okay, does this describe a feature or not, which we use to distinguish or not uh, to distinguish objects. Okay, yeah, so that, that's just what I was saying there. Okie dokie, um, yeah, so models. Uh, we get exactly the same thing that we had before. The limit of the process of filling out an undriveable sequence describes a model. I said all of that before. What happens with necessary identity models? They look exactly like um, Tim Williamson's models for S5, uh, quantified S5 with, um, yeah, constant domain, all of that kind of stuff. It's kind of boring, um, necessary identity, and it's all kind of there. The interesting thing is what happens with contingent identity models. And what happens there when you take an underivable sequence like this thing and fill it out, what you get is this distinction between the object in a context which is kind of a, a bundle together of a bunch of threads where the thread uh, across here, these threads that I've got on the screen, they are kind of the concepts which we're keeping track of in terms of our vocabulary of A, B, C, and D, et cetera. They're our concepts. They're the things that I'm keeping fixed from one epistemic context to another, which how do we determine what you know, counts as being the same context uh, same context across concepts. That's just however it is that we decide that we're using the, the concept Hesperus from here to there and there when we're shifting our zones. And the objects at each context are these you know, equivalence classes using the identity predicate represented here by the sort of merging highlights. And so you could think of these threads intersecting in various places and intersecting in different places from different zones. Across to another. And these are well understood, you know, if you like role and object or concept and object um, uh, models for modal logic, they're, they're well understood and they're, they're a natural way of uh, trying to sort of reify models for these things. But the nice thing in this case is seeing how they might arise out of a particular practice. And just to end with, the distinction between feature predicates and general predicates. Feature predicates are the things that hot on this view in the models turn out to be the things which hold or otherwise at these intersections of the, 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 the different concepts. And so if A and B name the same thing here at this point, uh, then a feature predicate or not holds of A and B together or it doesn't hold of A and B together. So you might have this feature which holds here and holds here and holds here and holds there, but doesn't hold here and doesn't hold here and doesn't hold there. Whereas a general predicate might, you know, get into the object and, you know, hold of this concept, but not that. So you get the general distinction between something holding an object and a mode of presentation, but understood in terms of how this arises out of the sort of use of the vocabulary. So there's more that you can do there, but I've um, gone way beyond uh, your patience. Uh, where should we go from here? Well, there's a bunch of philosophical questions. What speech acts and parts of speech play semantically significant roles? I've been focusing on assertion, denial, inference, or meeting a justification request, supposition. But I've also, in the talking about identity, been talking about predication and singular terms. They're the things that I'm saying are that they not only play a role in our kind of semantics, but also play a role in our practice and the norms governing our practice. 
Then there's also the question, if we start from the normative pragmatics, what are the appropriate kinds of models that we get? A bunch of philosophical questions that are there. But then formally, there's a whole bunch of open questions around hypersequent calculi, like cut elimination procedures, expressive powers, complexity, identity of proofs, translations between one system and another, and a whole bunch of things for us to be going on with when it comes to proving theorems. But that's way more uh, of your patience than I should have um, uh, uh, tested. So I should stop here. <laughs>